There's a lot of those one another's up there. How many holy kisses were there yesterday? Three? Four? I have questions. I have several questions. Um, when I was in college, I had a great time. Like some people talk about they go to college, didn't have a fantastic time, didn't enjoy their experience. I loved every minute of college. Like I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I went to a small Christian uh university called Union University, and you can see on this picture that I'm put up here in a little bit, uh, me and some of my friends uh, burning, I, I think we were burning notes like at the end of a semester or something like that. Yeah, there we go. You might be able to find me right there. Two things, two things stand out to me on this. First, I have put on some pounds. Look at that arm, man. Look at that little skinny guy right there. And uh, second, I'm really glad I wear medium shirts now instead of small shirts because that's a small dude. Uh, this was in the medium hair phase of Ronald. Um, this next picture is long hair phase Ronald. Um, and it was only slightly better, uh, only, only slightly better than, than what I've got uh, in that picture. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, might recognize the girl I'm sitting next to as well. Um, yeah, that was, that was me in college. Absolutely loved every single minute of it. When I went to college, I was ready to do stuff, okay? Like, that was my thing. Like, I was ready to serve because I came from a town that was pretty big-ish, and I was active in my youth group. Like, I, I served in big ways in my youth group as much as I possibly could. I played in the uh, youth praise band. I spoke whenever the youth leader, like, asked me to, to share a devotional thought for anything. And I told everybody that was going into youth ministry because that's what I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to go into youth ministry. So when I was in college, my, my thought was I'm going to serve in the college ministry. Because what I wanted to do was I wanted to use the gifts and talents and kind of see what other ministries were like because I knew that I wanted to do student ministry for the rest of my life. And, like, that's what I wanted to do. So I got heavily involved in our student ministry. And I went to a Baptist college. And I grew up as a Baptist pastor's son, all right? And so there was that part of me that, like, okay, like, I want to see what, like, the other people do. Right? What do those other guys out there do? And so I went to a non denominational church. It was a big step for me to go to a non denominational church. Um, but when I got there, they didn't have a building that they were meeting in, they were meeting in an elementary school. And their college ministry was actually meeting on the back porch of somebody's house. And there was one guy with a guitar who was leading worship. And I remember showing up and kind of saying, like, hey, I. I'm, I'm a freshman, I'm new, uh, this is my first year. Is there any way I can help? Like, do you need somebody else to play music? They said, oh, yeah, sure. What, what do, you, do you play bass? Do you have a guitar? I said, yeah, I play bass. Um, I said, well, why don't you go get it and come back, and you can start leading worship and helping out. And so I did. For my entire freshman year, I helped out leading worship with this college ministry, and it was a blast. So much so that that summer... Uh, after my first, like after my freshman year of college, I went and I played bass for a summer camp, uh, and did that all summer long. And I was absolutely thrilled. I was like, "This is pretty cool. Like, I get to teach people the Bible. I get to serve and use my gifts here. I get to sing a little bit. I get to play the bass. This is great." And one of the things I was most excited about was that this new church that I was going to was hiring a college pastor and building a building that we could meet in so we wouldn't have to meet on somebody's back porch anymore, right? And so they said, hey, when you guys come back for your sophomore year of college, your second year of college, we're going to have a college pastor. We're going to have a sweet new building for you guys to meet in, and it's going to just, like, elevate everything. It's going to be really great. And in the back of my mind, I envisioned myself 
up on that stage, helping out, leading worship, playing bass, doing everything. So that when I show up for the first time, imagine my surprise when there's an entire band up there and none of them are me. <laughs> and I meet the college pastor and he goes, hey, Ronald, really glad you're here. Um, what I want to do is I want to be reaching out to as many different colleges in this city as we can. And all four of these guys are from a different college uh, not the one that you go to. They're from a, a secular college, so we're really reaching out to there. Ronald, we need you to help us stack chairs every single week. That's how you're going to serve us. And I remember me and another friend were just livid. She had played like keys and like we were helping out, and we were not asked to come and be in the band. And we were mad because we weren't asked to come and to serve again. Instead, we were asked to come and to oh, stack the chairs. Like every Wednesday, we showed up an hour early and we put all the chairs out in rows. And then every Wednesday, we stayed an hour late and we took them all back and we put them away. And that was the extent of our service. That was what was asked of us. And I didn't like it. It was a moment for me where I was real upset about the opportunities that I thought I was going to have and the reality of what came my direction. What we're going to talk about this morning is serving one another. We're going to be in Galatians 5. We're going to start in Galatians 5.13 and be there. But I want us to kind of think about this. This is something that we all typically do. Sometimes we think, man, I've got this really great idea of how I want to spend my time, of how I want to use my abilities. And this idea that I have in my head is the best way that it's going to happen. Maybe you do play a musical instrument or uh, you can sing and you think that is the way that I can serve. And so like when you get put in like the kindergarten's class where like all they do is like clap like this and the old lady who's helping you sings off key and you're like, this hurts so much. Why am I here? Like so often when our idea of how we can serve doesn't match what we had pictured in our mind, we get upset. I know me, I got prideful and I thought my, my skills are wasted here. Stacking chairs. I can play the bass. I know four notes, all right? And so, like, there are people who play bass who know way more than that. I was just, that was me at that moment, all right? I was mad. Maybe it's because it's inconvenient, that service that's being asked of you. Maybe it's just because it's around people who make you uncomfortable. Or maybe it's stretching you in a way that you don't really want to be stretched at that moment. We're going to look this morning at how we can serve one another. And we're going to start in Galatians 5, like I said, in 13. And we're just going to read little bits of this, of this at a time and go from there. Galatians 5, 13, 13. I can speak this morning. It's going to be great. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Pause. <laughs> For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. We have a family tradition uh, in the Longhouse. Every year, before school gets started back up, we go to Splashtown. All right. Every year, before school gets started back up, we go to Splashtown. And my, my kids are the right ages where Splashtown is still a blast, right? They're not like, oh, this isn't Slitterbond. Like, no, they have a good time at Splashtown. And this last year, uh, having a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old, we had been several years in a row, and so we're like, okay, y'all know the map of the park, right? You know the place, the layout of where you can go. You guys, you two, do not need adult supervision. You can go. And they thought they were the coolest people in that entire park. Like, we would just be walking around, hanging out, and like, I'd see them run up to me and be like, Dad, we just did Starlight for the fifth time. It was awesome. And like, they were just running around this park, having a blast. And they were trying to see how many times they could go down this slide or how many times they could go to that slide. And they had an absolute blast of it. And like, at, at the same time, us as parents, we knew A, lifeguards are on duty. <laughs> 
So they're watching everybody. B, there's a fence around this thing, all right? Like, we have wristbands that say who they can leave with and who they can't. And if, like, an eight-year-old's like, la-di-da, I'm going to walk outside this park, nobody's going to let them walk outside the park. Like, we knew what was going on. We had given them freedom. And we have this freedom. It says, for you, we're called to be free, brothers and sisters. We often miss how free we are in our faith. Uh, Tim and Cameron and I often talk about this idea that we have this really big space that God gives us. And we can operate in this really big space. Imagine being in Splashtown and being like a 10-year-old or an 8-year-old who's having the absolute time of your life. That's what the Christian life is. God gives us this really big space that we can hang out in, and that's our freedom. We can do all sorts of things that we have here. There's so much that God has given to us. For example, bacon. Okay? I just want to point this out. As believers in Jesus, no longer under Jewish law, we could eat bacon now. There's a whole thing where God delivers a sheet in front of Peter and says, eat this food. And he goes, I don't know about it. And God says, eat it, it's clean. And Peter goes, okay. And bacon came from that, okay? God gives us this freedom. Sometimes. Sometimes. We start to believe that it's better over there, outside of our freedom, that we could have more fun over there. And that's where this comes from. And the next part of this verse, where it says, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Uh, my dad was a pastor. I said that. So we, we did lots of pastory things. We traveled around a lot. And one of the traditions that my family had was we went up to a place in North Carolina called Ridgecrest. It was a, a conference center, a big Baptist conference center up in the mountains. It was absolutely beautiful. We went every year from nine months before I was born until I graduated high school. Like, it was a tradition for us. So that was a thing that our family did. And after going every year and spending a week there... Every single year, by the time I was 16, 17, I knew the place fairly well. This was, this was like my territory. And whenever we went to Ridgecrest, I knew like what mountains we could hike, where the trails were, and all this stuff. And I knew where the lake was. The lake was really cool. And we, like, we would hike up there sometimes and we'd look at the lake. But the lake had several signs around it. Um, can you imagine what they may, maybe said, those signs around that lake? No swimming. Yeah. Probably a really good idea. So me and my buddies thought we were going to swim in the lake. And what, what we actually did to make this even better was there were, there were some piers, you know, that just like docks that came down out of the lake. And then there was a lookout spot from this lake. And we went up to the lookout spot on this lake that had like wooden railings all around it and a really big no swimming sign that wasn't like this, but it was more like this. It made just a really great platform for your feet. (laughs) And we actually jumped off of this no swimming sign. And as we are in the water um, swimming around, someone me, gets the bright idea of, let's swim over to that dock over there. And so we start swimming. Who are my swimmers in the room? It was far. (laughs) You guys know how far you can swim. I did not. I had absolutely no clue how far I could swim, and I misjudged it by not a small amount. And it was one of those moments when I thought, I'm going to drown in this lake out here because I'm cramping up and I don't know if I'm going to make it to that thing over there. My buddy who, had, who I roomed with in college and who had come with me every single year for the past 16 years got up on the dock and said, Ronald, you okay? 
Thank you, Jonathan Moore. Appreciate you. A guy who I'd met that week swam back out to me and literally carried me back by swimming and got me back to the dock where I pulled myself up and vomited all into the lake <laughs> because I was so scared and also cramping and also terrified at that same moment of, I almost died in there. Sometimes we get signs for a reason. <laughs> Like when the lake says no swimming, they probably know what they're talking about, all right? When God gives us laws to look through, it's not just an opportunity to say, we're free, we can do whatever we want. It's sometimes God telling us, no, nah, I really suggest actually that you stay in this really big space that I've given you because this is where it's going to be the best for you. We are free. We have so much freedom that God has given us. But he has also given us signs and guardrails and fences to say it's better in here. Why does God give us this freedom? Why does God tell us that we have all this freedom? For this. But serve one another through love. Serve one another through love. When I was stacking chairs, I had no love. <laughs> At least not for a couple first few weeks. I did not enjoy my experience stacking chairs. Because I was really upset. I thought that I could have another opportunity. And to be honest, I thought I could be up on stage. I thought I could be in front of people showing off my awesome bass playing skills and, and singing and leading. And it was honestly a really good moment for God to kind of take me and say, we need to work on this pride thing, Ronald. You get to stack chairs for a long time. How can we serve one another through love? How can we use the gifts and the talents and the abilities that God has given us to serve one another? I want to talk about that here in just a second. But there's something that we, I think we need to discuss and underlie at first. Verse 14 says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you love yourself? That's a weird question, I know. Right? Do, do you love yourself? It's one of those things that it is in the Bible and we forget about it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes, me, I serve other people in order to not think about how I think about myself. Because when I serve other people, it helps me to think this is about them and I don't have to think about what's going on in my own heart, in my own head, in my own mind. But the reality is God is telling us we need to understand how much God loves us. And that love for us that God gives to us and how he sent Jesus to die for us, how he moved heaven and earth so that we could accept his full gift of grace in our lives and for us, God loves us. And he tells us to love ourselves, not in a conceited way, not in a vain, I'm going to take a million selfies every day and pick the best of 500 type of way, but in a way that says, no, I am valuable. I am loved. God loves me. Therefore, I love myself. Do you love yourself? It's a question that we need to ask. If you were going to say, this is the main idea, this is the thing that you want to get out of this morning, it would just be this. Serve one another with love. 
serve one another with love. How can you do that? Right? Three ways that you can serve one another with love. And the first way is to recognize that you have to love yourself. You have to love yourself. You have value. God has given you value. You bear the very image of God inside of you. It does not matter what you look like. It doesn't matter where you came from. It does not matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter where you're born. You are valuable. God loves you. Therefore, there has to be within yourself a love of yourself. We have to start there. Because after you love yourself, you can then serve others well. How do we serve others, Ronald? Search for a need. Search for a need. They are all over the place. Your leaders are absolutely fantastic. This morning, some of them showed up early so that they could help serve. And we, we didn't give them like instructions on how they could do things. They just came up and said, what needs to get done? When we go on mission trips with the middle school ministry, we talk about this. There are good questions and bad questions, right? Bad question, when's lunch? <laughs> good question, what can we do before lunch? <laughs> When we talk about searching for a need, it's trying to find something that you can do. It might seem small to you, but for the person to whom you are serving, it might be huge to them. Look around and search for a need. And then last, the third thing, serve without expectations. Serve without expectations. I was never asked to play bass for that college ministry again. My one year in freshman, freshman in college, that was it. I never played bass for that college ministry ever again. I was never asked to speak or lead a Bible study for that college ministry ever again. And I don't think there was any like ill will towards me. Like the college pastor Wes was like, I don't like that guy. Like he... He had a different vision for the ministry. And instead of me going like, but I want to do this and my idea of service looks like that. Instead, I had to, needed to change my brain to think, no, I'm going to serve however I need to. I'm going to do what this ministry needs done. And what this ministry needed done was somebody to stack the chairs. <laughs> that was my job. It was stacking chairs. And it took me a long time to get to that point where I could be do that with love, where I could stack those chairs and think this is a worthwhile thing that I get to do. Because if nobody stacks the chairs, where are we going to sit? <laughs> Serving one another with love often means putting somebody else's needs ahead of your own because you've seen it. You've looked for it. You've noticed this need. And since you have a love for yourself that doesn't depend on how other people think about you, or what other people say about you, or all these other things, since you have a foundational love for yourself that comes from God, you can say, no, I can serve somebody. I don't need anything in return. I don't need anything to come back to me because I'm good. I just get to serve in a way that is a blessing to somebody else. I'm going to take a moment and pray for us. Then we're going to give some instructions, and then we're going to go do some things. But before we get there, let me pray. Our Father God, so often you challenge us in ways that we don't want to get challenged. God, so often you put something in front of us that we did not expect. Things did not go the way that we wanted. Lord, sometimes it's hard to serve somebody else. Perhaps because it's inconvenient to us. 
It's not the idea we had in our head. It's not what we want to do. But Lord, you put opportunities in front of us on purpose. So Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see how much you love us. To understand that that love is foundational to us being able to serve somebody else without expecting anything in return. But to serve just because we love them. God, you've given us so much freedom. Allow us to use the freedom that you have given us as an opportunity to serve rather than as an opportunity to do whatever it is we want to do. We love you, God. We thank you and we're grateful that you love us. And you proved it by sending us your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.